Howdy folks, it's Firecracker. Uh, glad you could join me today. Um, I'm going to be talking about what it means for a deck to be successful in Magic. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different terms that you've probably heard. Uh, I've actually got a list here. Um, uh, you've probably heard the best deck, the top deck, uh, tier one or top tier deck, uh, the deck to beat, uh, an established deck, a deck that's in the meta, uh, the right deck for a tournament. Um, so there's a lot of terms, and those don't actually all mean the same thing. There's some substantial differences uh, between them. So for example, I think that in a lot of cases, the deck to beat is not necessarily the best deck, right? I mean, if it's a deck that can be beaten, the deck that beats it could well be the best deck. Um, so there's all these kind of different uh, concepts about um, you know, what makes a deck good, what makes a deck central, what makes it a good choice to take to a tournament, which can be a different thing than being a good deck uh, in some situations. So if the metagame is really hostile to a particular deck, um, that deck might be powerful and good sort of in the abstract, but a, a poor choice for a particular tournament. Um, and so the reason I'm making this video now, and the thing that really kind of crystallized it, was that I was watching the Vintage Super League, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, you should give it a watch. Um, it's a weekly uh, uh, show, basically, on Twitch, um, that over the course of the season plays out a round-robin tournament between a bunch of pro players, Magic Hall of Famers, um, some players who are simply famous, and uh, some vintage luminaries, some guys who are really active in the vintage community. So if you want to see vintage magic, um, the Vintage Super League is one of the absolute best options. Um, so I was watching it, and there was a lot of discussion about uh, basically this deck. Um, not necessarily this exact 75, but um, this deck, uh, This the, the one that I'm showing you on the screen here uh, is uh, Jesse Martin's um, uh, Dark Petition Storm uh, from the Vintage Championship. Um, so this is before the restriction of uh, Chalice, uh, Dig Through Time, and the unrestriction of Thirst. Uh, but it's basically the same deck that everyone is still playing. Uh, the deck was designed by uh, Jesse Martin, as well as Adrian Becker and Andy Farias. Uh, hopefully I got your names right. Um, but uh, designed by them, uh, Jesse obviously did really well. Took a top 32 with his 24th place in the Vintage Champs. Um, and uh, Adrian, I believe, did well in the... Um, uh, preliminary tournament the day before. Um, so a couple of strong finishes from this deck, and this really kind of exploded interest in Dark Petition. Um, Storm had not really been uh, a huge, huge player uh, for the past couple of years. Um, uh, partially, you know, there were a lot of new cards printed and, and not a lot of new cards for Storm. Um, especially this kind of uh, Tendrils of Agony, Perfect Storm, kind of the classic, you know, blue-black restricted vintage deck. Um, it wasn't getting a lot of new cards, it wasn't getting a lot of interest, and um, it just, you know, uh, with the, uh, as well as the Rise of Workshops. So you've got um, the Mishra's Workshop decks became, you know, this huge, huge force in the metagame. Obviously, after Vintage Champs, they had, you know, a card restricted that was kind of targeted mostly at that deck. Obviously some other decks ran Chalice of the Void in multiples, but mostly um, it was a tool for the Mishra's Workshop decks. Um, so uh, a lot of people got really, really excited. I got really excited to see uh, a Storm deck, uh, a Perfect Storm, Tendrils of Agony style deck sort of coming back into the metagame. That's uh, like a really cool development, a really cool thing. and. Um, one thing that I saw, though, over time, sort of despite that excitement, was, you know, a lot of people picked up the deck, a lot of people tried it out, um, but the victories were, were not kind of flowing as freely as people might like. So, um, people in this Vintage Super League chat were talking, they're saying, um, you know, oh, wow, it's this, this Dark Magician Storm deck is crazy, you know, look at what it's doing in these Vintage Super League matches, um, this is just nuts. And uh, myself and, and a few other folks in chat were kind of like, you know, guys, 
uh, it's not doing that well. And you know, people in, in the Twitch chat are saying, you know, we've got to look at restricting Dark Petition Storm, right? So, so they're they're not just saying that it's like a good deck or a solid deck. Uh, the claim was that this deck is like so good it needs to have cards restricted, which is which is like a high bar to pass in Vintage. Um, uh, you know, Treasure Cruise got restricted fairly quickly, but we had like a year of dig through time. Um, Thirst for Knowledge was, you know, one of the most dominant vintage decks ever. Um, just incredibly dominant, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But, you know, Thirst for Knowledge was part of this incredibly dominant deck and got restricted, was restricted for a few years, and now it's unrestricted. So, not only is it hard, you know, it can be uh, hard to get on the restricted list, but uh, it can be, you know, it's certainly possible to get off. And there's been a trend over the past few years of unrestricting cards. Um, so Thirst for Knowledge was kind of a surprise for a lot of people, but it illustrates that even cards that have a track record of, of really dominating, really, really doing well in vintage, um, of putting up, you know, just absolute numerical superiority, those cards can still be unrestricted if, you know, the metagame has changed enough, enough time has passed, um, you know, having this track record of, of, you know, frankly, dominance, there's just no other word for it, um, is, is not something that prevents a card from being unrestricted. So when you say Dark Petition needs to be restricted, you know, part of what you're saying is, like, this is worse than Thirst for Knowledge, this is worse than... Um, a lot of these people are saying Lodestone Golem needs to be restricted as well, so it's not the best example, but, you know, this is worse than uh, uh, Oath of Druids, right? You know, Oath of Druids doesn't need to be restricted, but Dark Petition does, because it pushes the Storm deck over the limit. Um, and so it's a big claim. It's a really big claim, especially in Mittage. And uh, I, I was kind of trying to push back against that particular claim and say, you know, hold on a second, guys. This isn't, like, so great that it needs to be restricted, you know, for, based on my data. Um, and, I, and I give the figure 44%. Um, based on my data, it's only winning, you know, 44% of its games. Uh, and that was actually a little bit of an error on my part. I had a couple of decks mixed up. Um, but my data does show up below 50%, which, which I'll get to in a second. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not even winning half the time. It's, you know, like actively, if, if you're taking this into a tournament and you're performing at the average level, uh, you're actually hurting your chances for victory compared to taking in like a Mishra's Workshop deck and playing in an average level or taking a uh, Tesserator deck and performing at an average level, right? And so, um, uh, you know, I was saying like, you know, hold on, this deck isn't that great. And um, something, uh, I, at first I, I, I was a little perplexed by, but now I, th I think it's like really cool. Uh, that this happened was one of the Vintage Super League players, uh, Eric Froelich, um, who is a uh, you know phenomenal Magic player, uh, Pro Tour Hall of Famer, um, or, or I guess just Magic Hall of Famer um, is is the correct uh, wording there. Um, decided to step into the conversation and say like you know hold on guys like I've been doing really well in Vintage, I've been doing well in this Vintage Super League, and um, uh, I, I don't know about this particular season. I, I don't follow the standings that closely. I just like to watch the show. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he's, he's definitely had some good performances in, in the Vintage Super League. Um, and, you know, he said, like, I've been doing well with this deck. I won a tournament with it in, in the November Power 9 Challenge. This is a Tier 1 deck. This is, you know, one of the best decks in the format, right? Whatever, whatever Tier 1 means. Um, and so we had a little bit of back and forth, you know, you know, me making the point, you know, this win percentage isn't that good. Uh, some other uh, commentators in the chat were saying, you know, it's it's not really winning all that much in the daily events, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but Eric was really sort of sticking to his gun, saying, no, this is a great deck. You know, I've I've played with it. It's fantastic. It's phenomenal. Um, it, he he may not have been that effusive, but th that was the message. Um, and I, I, this was something that really like perplexed me at first because uh, I, I come from uh, kind of a, a science, a, a social science and statistics background. That's my education anyway. Um, and so, you know, to me, if, if you're saying, you know, you've got one guy who's saying, you know, here's the data, it's saying the deck's not so good. You've got another guy who's saying, um, you know, the, you know, this thing is fantastic, right? Like. 
um, you know, there has to be some some mechanism to resolve this, some way to to kind of uh, resolve that discrepancy. Um, and ultimately, what I realized was that um, I had all the data that that Eric Froelich had. You know, I knew that he had done well in it. I actually um, I, I played in that uh, November tournament. Um, uh, I think I went like three four. You know, nothing impressive. But you know, I played in that tournament. I was well aware, you know, that he had won the event. Um, he was, you know, very quickly in the conversation aware of these claims about the data that I was making, these claims about the data that uh, other people were making about what the daily event results look like. Uh, and the issue wasn't that you know he had some set of data we didn't, or we or we had some set of data that he didn't. And I don't think the issue was that we were being like irrational or that he was being irrational. I think the issue was that he was um, he was weighting the results differently because he was defining success differently. And I, I think that that's something that I wanted to talk about and dig into because I think it's really interesting of uh, the kind of idea of what does success even mean in magic. Um, so before, before, I, before I get into that too much, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just show you the data. Uh, this is something I was looking to publish uh, with a group that is local to where I am, um, a, a publisher. Um, that hasn't exactly happened, uh, so there's no, you know, like website article. Um, I've, I've done a bunch of website articles with Eternal Central uh, in the past, and um, if I if I do articles in the future, I think there's a pretty high probability that I'll go back with them. Um, although, you know, who knows? We'll see. Um, but uh, tried tried to publish it with a group that's that's a little bit more local to where I am, and that didn't quite pan out. Um, but uh, here's the data. Basically, what I did was I went in, uh, recorded all the player names, um, and some of these guys are famous players in a few cases. So, for example, Moss Dog Trainee is uh, Randy Bueller, um, which you know he's made he's made no secret of his username. So I I, I don't believe I'm like doxing him or anything. Uh, he's definitely shown his username on the Vintage Super League stream, and uh, you can find their videos on YouTube, that sort of thing. So you know Randy Bueller went in with Dredge. He did you know a winning record. Um, you know the Atog Lord uh, Rich Shea. You know he streams a lot. He makes no secret of his username or anything like that. Um, he did very well uh, five two. Uh, and so what I did was I, I just went in, recorded uh, their usernames, recorded their record in the Swiss, um, and then I actually watched uh, matches. I, I went in, you know, with my with my physical eyes and pulled up replays once the event ended to watch matches and and calculate, you know, uh, uh, you know what is this guy on, or not, you know, not calculate, but to record what is this guy on, and then I made kind of a judgment as to. Um, what the what the meta archetype was, and this is just for grouping, right? The meta archetype. I'm not claiming it's a pillar of the format or any any anything like that. It's just a, sort of a convenient grouping to let you deal with stuff. So, for example, non-storm combo is kind of a catch-all, right? Where it's you know combo decks that aren't dredge, they're not storm, they're not you know mentor tesserator because those are the other the other categories I had uh, in essence. Um, but there are you know, some other combo decks, so you get stuff like Splinter Twain and Belcher. Um, the, the others are pretty self-explanatory, you know, Dredge. The blue combo control is just Tesserator. Um, Gush Aggro is like Mentor and Pyromancer kind of aggro control decks. Um, so, you know, all, all reasonably self-explanatory. Um, so, uh, th these were the results, and um, I, as I said on stream, I actually was was slightly erroneous. The petition storm, uh, I said forty four percent. I actually was thinking of with of oath of druids. Uh, it's actually forty eight percent. And if you actually restrict that to uh, petition storm rather than uh, there, you have a couple of uh, of other storm, you know, tendrils storm variants. Um, if you, if you take those out, then you actually get 47%, because the other guys went 7 and 7, and it just brings the average a little closer to 50-50. Um, so, you know, if, if I, you know, go into this event uh, with a, you know, Dark Petition Storm deck, uh, and I get an average result out of it, um, I'm going to be hurting my chances. I'm going to be hurting my chances in the event a little bit. And so that's the data I was arguing from. Um, 
and uh, the you know one reason that that doesn't really you know cohere to what Eric was experiencing. You know, one reason there's a couple, but one reason is that he's not expecting to get an average result, right? Um, he's not expecting to get an average result, you know, with the deck. He's expecting to get you know, the, the top result. He's, you know, expecting, I'm going to go in, I'm going to learn the deck, I'm going to play at my best, and he's, you know, obviously a very great Magic player, um, and he's going to get, you know, the, the best result from the deck, right? He's going to be, you know, ideally he's going to be the guy who's going, you know, 6-1, or, you know, that's not, uh, sorry, that's not Dark Magician Storm, but, he, you know, he'll be the guy going 5-2 and, you know, making top 8 on tiebreakers and winning the event. Or he'll he'll go, you know, like 6-1 and make top 8 and win the event, right? That's the plan. That's what you're hoping for. Um, and so uh, what he's, like, measuring and what the way he's defining, you know, the success and the win rate of the deck are different than you know, how I'm defining it. So even though we have, you know, access to the same data, and presumably we agree on, you know, the veracity of the data, um, he wasn't, you know, like calling me out and saying I was making it up or anything, which I'm not. <laughs> uh, but, you know, even if we agree, let me phrase it that way, even if we agree on the data, uh, if we're evaluating it to different standards and with different goals for you know what's supposed to come out of the calculation, we can get very different results. Um, and so you know, sort of diving into that concept. Um, oh wow, business talk, diving in, deep diving. Um, <laughs> so examining that concept a little more closely, I think there are kind of three models for what success means in Magic, what it means to be a good deck or, or a top deck or something like that. And so I just, I, I want to kind of dive in, there it goes again, I want to kind of explain what I see as the three models for evaluating success in Magic. Um, the first one is, is the one that I generally favor. Um, it's also by far the hardest to collect because it requires learning about decks that did poorly, it requires uh, learning about um, uh, decks that, that aren't reported in, in the top eight, I, I guess that's going to be your decks that did poorly. Um, in a lot of cases it requires learning about decks that have dropped out. Uh, so for example in my um, uh, in this here, I've actually got a dredge deck that went 1-0, and I don't know if he had a, a personal obligation or what it was, but went 1-0 and dropped out. All right, so trying to get all of these, you know, to get the full picture of a tournament or a metagame, uh, it's clearly going to be the hardest thing to do, right? Um, and the, the value, if you do get that, is you can calculate uh, actual win percentages, right? This is just an example of the sort of data that I'm trying to produce, the sort of data that I value that I think helps me make decisions. And I don't believe that this is uh, necessarily or totally uh, the sort of data that Eric Froelich or other pro players actually value all that highly. Um, and so uh, this is the sort of data that says, you know, if you're an average burn player, for example, just to take what's on the screen, you're going to get a 54% win rate. So if you're an average burn player, it's going to help you win a little bit, right? And to me, that's the kind of data that says, you know, what's going on in the metagame uh, kind of long term or on a big scale. It says, you know, sort of what's going to happen uh, over time to the representation in the metagame. So for example, uh, Blue Red Storm is probably going to drop off as those players you know, lose events more than they feel like they should and they switch to other decks. Right? And so to me this is, ex this is like gold. This is like extremely valuable. But it's not the only way to measure success. Um, uh, 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 one measure of success that I feel is uh, a little more short term and has some disadvantages we'll talk about is to look at uh, like top eights. Uh, in this case what I have is I have the MTG Goldfish, um, their vintage metagame. So this is uh, decks that have cached uh, online events and been reported. So 3-1 and 4-0 decks. So it's kind of roughly analogous to top eights in mid-sized tournaments, uh, roughly. Um, and if you look at this, we've got you know 30% of the metagame is workshops. Uh, Dark Petition Storm is about 5% of the metagame. Uh, we've got a few different dredge variants. 
that uh, actually add up to about 20% of the metagame, uh, just under, um, uh, a little under, but um, add up to, I think, 17% here if you add all the dredge variants together. Um, so uh, this, you know, sort of records uh, what's winning, what's doing well, but it doesn't record um, how hard it was to get those wins. It doesn't record uh, uh, the number of players that, that have played it. So Workshops, you know, in addition to being one of the most winning decks on Magic Online, is also one of the most played decks. And the two are certainly related because, like I said here, you know, if you're playing a deck that has a 40% win rate, you're probably going to try to change what deck you're playing. All right, so it's winning enough to keep a lot of players interested, um, and those players who are you know continuing to play the deck are you know making up almost thirty percent of the metagame. And so this is actually um, like uh, a, a very different way to view the deck, um, and as a result, you you get kind of a different picture. Um, so you know if if I look at something like this um, where I'm actually you know, calculating win rates, I say like, oh wow, Dredge won you know 65% of its games. Um, you know these very miscellaneous non-storm decks won almost 60%. Uh, shops won 56, 57% of their games. Um, uh, my uh, blue, you know, Tesserator decks won 50% of their games. Mentor won 49. Yeah, Mentor and Pyromancer won 49% of their games. And so, if I look at this, these results in the win rate, and then I come here, I'm expecting to see Dredge, then Shops, then uh, Tesserator, then Mentor, right? Because people should be playing the decks that win more at a, at a higher rate, and and we're just not seeing that. Um, because the the relationship isn't quite that straightforward. The you know the this takes into account uh, what decks people are playing. What decks people are playing doesn't you know like perfectly represent um, the win rates of decks. People play decks because they're fun. They play the decks they have access to. So there's a lot of factors that that influence this. And uh, as a result, you can end up with with a very different picture than just the win rate would give you. Um, one thing that's worth noting here is like, you know, Dredge is actually, you know, there's like four players playing it, only three of which played through the whole event, uh, the whole Swiss portion. Um, so, you know, Dredge getting like a really good uh, percentage there doesn't necessarily tell you all that much. Um, so you know, to to me, this is this is very valuable. Um, another kind of version of the same thing that's very valuable is going to be something like this, um, which is uh, th these uh, these are kind of garbled, but this is July slash August, September slash October, and so on. Uh, uh, multi month uh, kind of increments there. Um, but this is kind of a famous chart if you're a vintage player, um, because that top you know this mana drain deck. It, it's basically the Tesserator Thirst for Knowledge deck that got Thirst for Knowledge restricted, right? And so this, to me, this is what dominance looks like. This is what, you know, just absolutely brutalizing the vintage metagame looks like. Um, as opposed to, you know, something like this, where, you know, Dark Petition Storm is 5%. Um, to me, that's not dominance, right? And so uh, if you're... Um, if your model of what's a good deck and what's a strong deck is, you know, something like this where you're looking at win rates, or something like this where you're looking at win rates, um, you know, based on the results that I've seen, uh, Dark Petition Storm isn't that that um, impressive. But if your model is something like this, it's a little more impressive. It's solid. And then if your model is a single event, which I think for a lot of pro players it is. Right, so the idea, if you're a pro player, you're used to, you know, going into a pro tour where it's a single tournament, a single weekend, and the metagame is not settled. The metagame isn't known in advance. It's not going to continue for months, you know, before you get to try again at that same format. Um, so in those events, uh, if you're a pro player, you're used to the idea that the metagame is exists for a single weekend. Right, the metagame isn't you know, 28% workshops over the course of, you know, two months, right? That's not the metagame. The metagame is, you know, the 500 decks 
that walk into the room. You know, that players walk into the room and sit down with their deck across from you, across you know, across the table, right? That's the meta game for that tournament. And so when you're looking at that, you know, from that perspective, um, if if you're trying to look back at a tournament and say, you know, what was the best deck for the meta game of this tournament? Uh, it's a pretty good guess that the deck that won was a, was a great choice, right? So if you look at the November Power Nine Challenge on Magic Online, um, it's a pretty good guess that Storm was a really strong choice to bring to the tournament um, because it won the event, right? That's uh, there's kind of uh, strong evidence there. Um, I would say you know whatever deck wins the event has to get very lucky. It's not just luck. There's a lot of, you know, player skill and deck selection that goes into it and makes it easier to get lucky. But, um, you know, just as one example, if you could just teleport and start in the semifinals and you've got a 70% win rate. So, like, wow, you're really favored. You know, like, you know, uh, Eric Froelich and, you know, Kai Buda and John Finkel and, you know, the really great Magic players they don't have a 70% win rate, right? They're, you know, 60, maybe 65%, you know, at best, right? So we're talking like a great player on a good day or a good player on like their best day with, you know, a great deck for that event, right? Your 70%, it's very, very, it's great for you, right? So you warp in, you teleport into the semifinals and you're 70%, all right, then you, then you, you know, win or lose. And if you win in the finals, you're 70%. Right, so you know, like just incredibly favored, right? In that scenario, you know, 0.7 times 0.7, it's like seven, seven, seven times seven, it's 49. So you actually get 0.49. You actually have to get lucky if you teleport into the seven semifinals and you have a 70% win rate. You actually have to get lucky to win the tournament, right? Uh, you're the most likely single individual to win the tournament, uh, but you're you're still you still have to get lucky. Right, you're still not you're still not you know the favorite uh, compared to you know do you win the tournament do you lose the tournament you still have to get lucky to be the win the tournament version of that right so even if you come into like the beginning you play through the whole event with you know 70 80 percent win rate something really ridiculous um, you have to get very lucky and uh, sort of you know part of the point I'm making is that um, you know, when you win a tournament, it's it's an indication a that you got very lucky, and b that your you know probability of getting lucky was probably a lot higher than everybody else's. You probably were the seventy percent guy or the eighty percent guy. But the thing is that 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 only really holds for a single tournament, right? The guy who won the tournament. That's a lot of useful data that says there's something good and strong about the deck, most likely. Um, but that data can can be drowned out over time, right? So if if you shift your view and you say, you know, you know, you look at just the tournament, you're going to say, wow, this deck is great. And then you, you know, in this meta game, in this you know single tournament meta game, and then you shift your view and you look at a longer time period. You look at you know something like this over the course of six months. Um, or I think this is uh, 10 months, um, right? You look at something really long term, or this is, uh, you know, like one to two months, right? The deck that did great and that has this solid evidence that it's fantastic can be mediocre or bad. And those two aren't contradictory. They're just, you know, they're referring to different things, right? So, you know, the claim that the deck is great in this tournament doesn't contradict at all the claim that the deck is poor in the metagame in the longer term. So um, uh, basically the, the, the kind of final message and the, the takeaway here is you know when you're trying to say a deck is, is good or bad um, that there's something that's that's not very meaningful about that. It has to be you know to what standard, in what metagame, over what time period. And you know, if your goal like, you know, I'm mostly a deck builder, I mostly look, you know, fairly long term. And so for me, if I see a deck that has really sustained success, I say, wow, that deck is good. You know, even even if it's not really taking down a lot of tournaments. So for example, you know, workshops, um, 
there have been situations in you know vintage where it's like clearly the best deck and it wins you know some of the big tournaments some of the really important tournaments but it's not winning like all the small tournaments like crazy it's not it's not crushing the meta game according to tournament wins but when you take a step back and you look at you know not what was the best deck in this in this small tournament but what's the best deck over this time period it becomes really apparent that it's workshops that it's you know the thirst for knowledge deck that it's uh, you know whatever it is that it's cobblade right um, so you know when you're trying to plan for uh, how you're going to to approach a meta game, um, you know the kind of advice here is you know keep in mind you know what the time frame is, what the meta game is, uh, because you know maybe the correct choice is to take a deck, you know to take blue white standstill, which you know isn't seeing a ton of play, isn't successful all over the place, but if that's the right fit for the meta game on you know the week that you're going to play in, you know that one little tournament, then that deck is top tier, right? It's the best deck, it's the right deck, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so that's the advice, um, and I, I think that's the way to kind of resolve this this issue where, you know, a deck can win an event, and then it, you know, performs really poorly, and, you know, is it a good deck or a bad deck? Is it, you know, the metagame didn't shift like crazy in that month, um, and I, and I really think that's the, the correct way to sort of resolve it and understand it. So uh, thanks for watching, guys. I, I, I hope you learned something. I hope this is useful to you. Um, and, and I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you.